This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service, Nebula. Hey, happy Friday and welcome to probably the only corner of the whole internet that isn't talking about the US elections right now. Instead, I'm going to be talking about Samsung's Exynos processors looking surprisingly good. I'm going to be talking about Micromax phones looking surprisingly good. And we'll also talk about the world's largest IPO failing spectacularly. Also this week, we have an unusual quiz that is actually also a giveaway. It's a special quiz all about Nokia. And if you get at least 10 questions right, you get a chance to win a Nokia 8.3. Links and details are in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my pick of the week will be Samsung looking to have a fantastic year with its Exynos mobile processors. With new reports from Business Korea claiming that Oppo and Xiaomi are both joining Vivo in adopting Exynos processors in their phones next year. The exact details like which chips they will use are still unclear, but given that a few weeks ago Vivo was set to start with the almost flagship Exynos 1080, it's likely that the others will use the upper mid-range or maybe even flagship Exynos chips as well. That means that all of a sudden four of the top five Android phone makers are expected to launch major devices with Exynos chips soon, which Business Korea expects to propel Samsung's chip business to the third spot globally in terms of shipments, ahead of Apple's A-series chips and Huawei's Kirin chips, but still behind MediaTek and the market leader Qualcomm. If we pair that with other reports that claim that flagship Exynos processors will actually have very comparable performance to flagship Snapdragon processors next year, we might just be looking at a spectacular turnaround from Samsung. Just earlier this year, Exynos chips were so far behind that even Samsung didn't end up using them in their own Galaxy S20 series in their home market of Korea, but next year Samsung might actually become a real competitor to Qualcomm. And if you are like me, you are probably wondering how this gigantic shift just happened all of a sudden. And there are no clear answers to that question yet, and I'm not exactly a chip expert myself, but here's my best guess. There are three key parts to making a mobile processor. The ISA, or Instruction Set Architecture, which ARM provides for all phone processors. The actual processor design, which anyone can design. ARM has a standard set, while chip makers like Apple and Samsung have traditionally designed their own. And finally, the actual manufacturing. Last year, Samsung announced that after five years of trying and failing to beat ARM reference designs, they would stop designing their own CPU cores. They fired their whole CPU design team and they would just adopt the standard ARM designs similar to Qualcomm. That probably freed up a lot of money and at the same time, they also announced that they would invest over a hundred billion dollars into the actual manufacturing and make that world class. Their manufacturing appears to have gotten so good that Qualcomm Qualcomm actually decided to have their Snapdragon 875 made by Samsung as well, meaning that some Snapdragon and Exynos chips will have very comparable designs and will use pretty much the same manufacturing processes as well. This is obviously an oversimplification. There's more to a mobile processor than just the CPU itself, and Qualcomm has some of its own customizations on top of whatever ARM gives them. But if everything goes well, this means that theoretically, starting next year, Exynos could become a proper competitor. And that's really exciting. Okay, my win of the week is actually gonna be a really short one, and it is that the big comeback of Micromax has finally happened with two brand new phones, and they appear to have proven me wrong from last week. The phones look like entry-level models that cost around $100 to $150, and they appear to be fairly competitive on paper with whatever Xiaomi and Samsung have to offer in this price range, with decent specs, big batteries, etc. The teasers they released a week earlier made it look like their phones would become pretty much exact copies of an Honor phone, and while the covers themselves certainly are, the rest of the device seems different. Oh, and <laughs> did you know it's Indian? Because it's literally in every headline on their page. Given Micromax's past, I actually expect many skeletons to be hiding in some closet that will fall out eventually, so I don't think the story is quite over yet. But the phones on paper look interesting, and if they manage to get the support and the quality control and all these kinds of things properly right, then the world might just have a new smartphone competitor. And my feel of the week is gonna be a massively juicy corporate drama story coming out of China Tech. The world's largest IPO happening and then being canceled abruptly right after. 
So Ant Financial is the world's largest financial technology company worth over $300 billion that grew out of Alibaba, the closest thing there is to a Chinese Amazon. Ant Group is well known for Alipay, the ultra popular mobile wallet in China, but it also has a ton of other services around loans, credit ratings, wealth management, and more. And it's even invested in a bunch of leading international companies from India's Paytm and Korea's Kakao Pay. In other words, the company is a huge deal and it is only six years old, so it's on a meteoric rise basically, and in no small part because of Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba and probably the supreme patriarch of all of this, is apparently really good buddies with a lot of party officials and a lot of people in the government, and that let them kind of just skip a lot of the regulation and bureaucracy that other fintech companies and financial organizations have to deal with. The company was on track to IPO this week, meaning that it got listed on a public stock exchange and it raised $34.5 billion, which would have made this the largest IPO in history. For comparison, they raised seven times as much money as Xiaomi raised last year. But then, feeling maybe a little too confident, Jack gave a speech a few days before the IPO at an event in Shanghai, strongly criticizing the very regulations and bureaucracy he was able to bypass, saying that it is holding back the innovation innovation of the country. What's amazing is that the very audience that he delivered this speech to were the financial regulators of the country, who heard the speech and thought it was, and I'm quoting, a punch in their faces. So right after the speech they decided that, you know what, maybe now would be a really good time to look into the regulatory and compliance side of things with End Group and kind of do some investigations. Suddenly, Ant Group got investigated left and right. It was found out that a bunch of their business practices were way out of line with standard financial regulations. The IPO was suspended and Jack Ma reportedly personally missed out on adding at least $27 billion to his net worth. Which, uh, if you ask me, goes straight into the book of gigantic oopsies. I mean, it's obviously a very big and very expensive oopsie for Jack, but it's also kind of an oopsie for all the financial regulators, because if you think about it, they have just exposed that unless Jack Ma had said something unnice about them, they would have just let all of this pass. Anyway, if the end financial case proves anything at all, I guess it is that trusting one's entire existence on some supreme overlords that one has very little power over is a very risky strategy, which is a big part of why I got together with some of the world's best educational content creators and created Nebula. Nebula is our personal video streaming platform to evade our supreme overlords over at YouTube. It's owned and operated by creators like myself, Real Engineering, Low Spec Gamer, Wendover Productions, Renee Ritchie, Polymatter, and more. And because it's ours, we can do with it whatever we'd like. That includes no ads, no tracking, no algorithm, all of our regular YouTube videos, in the case of my Tech Altar channel, usually a day earlier as well, and a ton of really fantastic Nebula originals. Real Engineering recently wrapped up his fantastic Nebula original series on the logistics of D-Day, Mustard recently posted a hilarious yet very illuminating original on the world's ugliest plane, and City Beautiful ranked the best cities from the perspective of a real-life urban planner. Since Nebula is owned by us, the creators, watching content there supports us directly, and better yet, access to Nebula comes for free with a subscription to my sponsor, CuriosityStream, which itself is 26% off right now, so you can get both services for just over a dollar a month. CuriosityStream is of course the premier place on the internet for high quality professional documentaries from the founders of the Discovery Channel, and they have a huge library of science, nature, and history content to binge while you are stuck at home. I have just finished watching Cyber War on CuriosityStream, which is a documentary on hackers and governments doing nasty things, because apparently that's just the world we live in right now, and there is a ton of other great content from hosts like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. So check them out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next week.